So thanks everyone for coming. Um, uh, it's the last slot of the day, and uh, I know the headphone thing is kind of weird. Uh, so um, let's get started. Uh, I want to talk to you today about making fuzzing part of your software development lifecycle. But before we do that, I want to say a bit about myself, uh, just to give you some context. Um, so I've been working at Google for five years, and uh, during this entire time, I've been working on fuzzing. And by fuzzing, I mean that I've been working on infrastructure for fuzzing rather than you know, writing different fuzzers my whole time. And so uh, the infrastructure that I work on is for developers, ordinary developers, you know, non-security engineers, to fuzz their own code. So I've basically been helping um, developers do that for five years. Uh, the first three of that was on Chrome, uh, and the last two have been on uh, the newly created open source security team. Um, uh, that being said, like the usual disclaimers apply, and you know I'm only here on behalf of myself today. So just like the key takeaway uh, I want to share is that um, there are a bunch of tools these days, uh, like such as OSS Fuzz and Cluster Fuzz Lite, that make it very easy to just sort of um, you know incorporate fuzzing into your uh, d software development lifecycle, almost as you would like say like an integration test or maybe like a particularly long uh, running one. And I'll share how uh, those tools do this uh, in the talk. So uh, to start, let's just um, you know, define what fuzzing is, like why should you care about it, you know, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, who cares about it? Well, uh, a lot of people do. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, Google does. Um, we fuzz on hundreds of thousands of cores uh, around the clock. And we fuzz pretty much every like, major like, product that Google has. We fuzz uh, Android, Chrome, as I mentioned, Chrome OS, um, you know, the internal code that we work on. Uh, and many other co companies um, use fuzzing as well. Um, Microsoft actually develops like, their own fuzzing infrastructure that's similar to ours. And the reason why um, you know, it's used uh, so widely is because of how uh, good it is at discovering vulnerabilities. Uh, every year it finds thousands of, uh, of bugs in software, and many of them are security problems. And so fuzzing is a sort of unique way in which you could find bugs by spending uh, compute time rather than developer time. And uh, another reason why you should fuzz your code uh, is because it's a technique that bad guys could use too, right? So, um, you know, uh, the saying, like, fuzz your code or someone else will. Uh, and this is an example of that where a uh, fuzzing tool released by Google called Syscaller uh, found a bug in the Linux kernel. And uh, I believe this bug was unpatched um, when Syscaller found it. But in any case, uh, it was later found that the uh, NSO uh, group was using this to target Android users. So, um, you know, the vulnerabilities that fuzzing can find are uh, particularly, like, low-hanging fruit for bad actors and can be weaponized by them in many cases as well. So what is fuzzing? Uh, the way I think of fuzzing is uh, it's an automated uh, process where you're creating new randomized inputs and feeding them to a program uh, in order to get that program to crash. Um, and it would sort of work like this pseudocode that I have on the slide here, where you've got an infinite loop. Um, and the reason why it's like an infinite loop is because uh, we don't really know when to stop fuzzing usually. Like, fuzzing can show that like, your code has bugs, but it can't really prove that it doesn't have bugs. Um, so it's like frequently fuzzers run uh, for an infinite amount of time. And obviously, um, to incorporate it in your workflow, you don't want to do that. So we have some solutions for that. But um, essentially, you've got this infinite loop. And just on each iteration, you're creating a new uh, input to feed to the code uh, you want to test. And so. How did this come about? Like, you know, how did, how did this get started? Uh, I think it was in like the early 90s or maybe late 80s, which is you know, quite um, a while ago. Uh, it was when, it's at least when fuzzing um, was given the name fuzzing. Like there might have been like sort of variants on it that existed earlier. But um, basically what had happened um, was uh, an academic was connecting to their uh, university computer. And uh, this connection was being done over dial-up. And it was a dark and stormy night. And so the rain was causing that dial-up connection to send like spurious characters to the programs that they were interacting with uh, on their university server. And uh, these programs, act, sorry, these uh, spurious characters actually caused these programs to crash. And so 
uh, the academics, uh, being as smart as they are, figured, well, we don't only need rain to send these spurious uh, characters to crash our programs. We can actually uh, write other programs to send these spurious characters. Uh, and that's basically how fuzzing was born. And so uh, the way these original fuzzers worked was pretty much like copying data from like DevU random and feeding it to a target program. So say, for example, we were fuzzing um, something like Chrome's uh, JavaScript engine, which is V8. Uh, it would look something like this, where we're taking bytes from DevU random, um, putting them in a file, and then running V8 on that file. Now, uh, I think you're probably very unlikely to find uh, a bug using this technique, at least in V8. Uh, the, this, this looks like nothing like JavaScript. These are unprintable characters. Um, you know, you're going to get a parse error very early on. And there's not many like, interesting bugs uh, in V8's parser. Most of the bugs are like, deeper uh, down, like in the just-in-time compiler, um, you know, having to do with like, memory management. So you really won't find anything with this technique. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, code like this, you know, test cases like this, which are you know, relatively like, simple. Um, which can crash V8. So we want to get fuzzers to be able to produce things um, you know, like this on, uh, on, on my left over here, this snippet, which was actually produced by a fuzzer and uh, did, does crash V8, I believe. Um, and so uh, the way the second generation of fuzzers addressed this problem was they were format aware. Uh, you would basically, uh, if you're fuzzing a program like a JavaScript uh, engine, you would write uh, a you would write another program that could either mutate JavaScript or like create JavaScript from scratch. And that JavaScript would just be very weird, like the example I have here. And that would sort of you know, do like weird behavior, basically. You can cause the uh, uh, you know, target program to get into an interesting state. And from there, hopefully, uh, crash the program or find a bug in it. Um, and so uh, like, right, you could see here just like a simple snippet of how it creates for loops. It's just literally like concatenating like four uh, open paren, you know, an init statement, a conditional, and then iterate uh, statement. So that's like all well and good. And, you know, it's still a very effective technique. And it's used by security uh, researchers and bad people as well uh, today. But how do you get uh, tests, or how do you get fuzzing to a state where it could actually be used by developers? Um, you know, this previous technique, um, that's just one line, but you know, these fuzzers uh, will be very, uh, very long, and it's basically like a full-time job writing one. And you know, software engineers want to write their own software. They don't want to spend that much effort on testing. Um, so before we do that, I want to just maybe think about some of the things we want out of fuzzing uh, by looking at what makes other sorts of tests good. Uh, so um, one of these is uh, they're written by the developers themselves. Um, I think uh, in some places they might like have QA, which does testing separately. Um, that's never been anywhere uh, I've worked, and I think I think generally um, it's accepted that like developers should be testing their own code today. So that's uh, one uh, thing we want out of fuzzing. Um, another thing is like this will probably be first, but you know you want tests that actually find things, right? Um, and so you know it's kind of obvious, but um, it's worth stating. Uh, next is you want your test to be continuously run. Um, that's with this whole like CI practice, continuous integration. Um, you know, it's based on the sort of realization that it's easier to like fix your. Um, you know, it, it's easier if you're incremental, if you're just merging very frequently than if you're waiting all at once. You know, if you're testing, um, if you're testing every time before you merge your code, it's going to be much easier to fix your code than when you, uh, you know, if you wait like a month to test it. Uh, and finally, like speed is like another thing that helps with tests. Uh, if your tests are really slow to run, um, it can make it uh, pretty painful for developers to fix uh, any issues found by the test, right? Because you know the test will point out an issue, the developer will try to fix it, and then run the test again. And if they have to wait like an hour, I think um, you know that's pretty much too burdensome for a developer to deal with. So uh, let's look at how uh, fuzzing can be done uh, by developers themselves, and. Uh, the uh, technique that really allowed this is called coverage-guided fuzzing. And so uh, coverage-guided fuzzing is based on the insight that instead of um, teaching the fuzzer about the formats that it's fuzzing, uh, maybe the fuzzer could sort of learn to produce inputs that look like that format. Um, and, so, uh, and so 
This really allows you to write fuzzers in a way that um, you just want to point out the code that you're targeting, uh, but you don't really have to invest in the mutator as that's generic, but the fuzzer sort of learns to produce interesting inputs. And I'll show how actually uh, right next. So um, let's say we were fuzzing something like a PDF reader. Uh, you would start with uh, a corpus, which is basically just like a, f a fancy Latin word for, uh, um, for a, like a folder that will contain different PDF files that you think exercise different parts of your program, right? Like you'll have one with images, you'll have one um, with a form maybe, um, you know, interesting inputs basically. And the fuzzer uh, will pick one of these inputs at random to mutate. And uh, when it has this test case it wants to mutate, it'll also pick random mutations to do to the test case. So, uh, and these mutations are totally generic. Um, they're things like bit flips and, uh, you know, erasing bytes, inserting bytes. Um, and so, you know, when a developer writes a fuzzer uh, using coverage-guided fuzzing, typically they don't even touch these mutations. Um, now, this test case gets mutated and then fed to the target code. Um, like with, like, older generations of fuzzing, obviously if we find a crash, you know, bingo, that's our goal, and, like, we could sort of stop there. But the sort of magic of coverage-guided fuzzing is if there's no crash, the... Um, coverage-guided fuzzer will look at which parts of the targeted code were actually executed. And if the test case exercises new parts of the targeted code, um, then it knows that it's, you know, able to, like, it's found, like, new, it's able to produce, like, new behavior in the targeted code, right? And so you can see how, so it'll add the test case to the corpus for possible further mutation. And you can see how, um, you know, after a few rounds of this, you might like evolve inputs to get deeper and deeper into the um, you know target code. Like let's say you have uh, uh, a magic. Let, let's say you have like an elf. You're fuzzing elves. Um, you know there's like a magic string like elf that starts off the binary. So like on the first time you might randomly produce a test case that has e that'll get added to the corpus. Then in the next uh, iteration you might happen to produce one that. Um, uh, has the letter E, like has the letters E, L, and then so on and so forth until you're actually producing interesting inputs. Um, so it's not really learning about like how to mutate the format, but it's like it's still by being sort of like stupid but trying very many times. And typically, this needs to run like thousands of times per second to work well. Um, it can actually like pr you know result in interesting test cases. The, uh, this process is sometimes why it's called like evolutionary. Um, coverage-guided fuzzing, because, you know, it's evolving more interesting test cases. Um, now, another tool that made uh, developers, made it easy for developers to write their own uh, fuzzers was libfuzzer. Um, most uh, other, uh, so the original coverage-guided fuzzer, AFL, uh, was initially meant to run on the entire program. Like, you would just, uh, you know, take a binary, um, like a SQLite, and just, uh, through standard, uh, AFL would pass it uh, data through like standard in. But what libfuzzer did was um, it had this concept of uh, a fuzzing harness or target where basically you use this, uh, you define this function LVM fuzzer test one input and you link the fuzzer against uh, that uh, function and the fuzzer will pass it, you know, call, call this function in the loop and pass it uh, the test cases. And so this allows you to like, you know, write fuzzers that are actually almost like unit tests, right? And so you could fuzz specific parts of your code and, uh, you know, just like your workflow would be with unit tests. This is an actual example from uh, OpenSSL, I think. Um, so that uh, LVM fuzzer test one input, um, although it was sort of created by libfuzzer, uh, is still, it's basically become the standard just because, um, like, it was sort of like the lowest common denominator. And so a lot of other, like, alternative tools to uh, libfuzzer, such as uh, AFL++ or hongfuzz, um, they support uh, that uh, function as well. But we're not really going to be discussing um, those uh, fuzzing engines to today. And so, uh, as I mentioned, like, you obviously want to find bugs. And so, um, you know, how do you do that? Uh, like, one way, uh, the most obvious solution, well, well let, me, let me, like, describe the problem a bit more in detail. Um, with like a unit test, it's very easy to determine uh, if the program, like how the program should behave for a single given input. But the fuzzer is going to give, um, you know, the targeted code, like 
uh, arbitrary inputs. And so it's a lot harder to define how it should behave in an arbitrary case. So uh, the most common way um, you, know, you determine if the program has a bug in it is um, like, you know, if it has like a, if it's exhibited like a sort of generic bug that's like not application specific. And uh, for C and C++ programs, the most common of these is uh, memory corruption. So um, in C and C++, uh, the, 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 the languages are not uh, memory safe. And so you can do things like dereference pointers that don't exist, um, you know, use memory after freeing it. And uh, this will sometimes result in a segmentation fault. Um, but when that happens, it's not really deterministic. Uh, and so what you'll want to do is try to get that more deterministic and also more actionable, right? Like, uh, you know, when you just get the message segmentation fault, it's not really telling you um, where the bug is or how to fix it. So uh, we use tools called sanitizers, which um, the original ones were all written for C and C++ type issues, like memory corruption, um, overflowing integers, basically, you know, bugs that wouldn't necessarily cause the program to crash right away. Um, these sanitizers make the program crash, and that's how we signal to the fuzzer that it's found uh, a bug. Now, uh, that was only really for C and C++, and um, if you are writing any code in C and C++, like, you know, fuzz your code, I promise you, you'll find tons of stuff um, that'll be interesting. But um, if you're not fuzzing, if you're not writing C and C++ code, um, it's a trickier question, like what kind of bugs you want to find uh, with fuzzing. So um, the first, like the most obvious answer is just like crashes that cause denial of service issues. Um, you know, crashes in uh, non-C++ code are not really uh, indicative of memory corruption. And I don't, know, I don't know if I said, but you know, memory corruption, it can not only cause crashes, it could cause, uh, um, you know, if an attacker, uh, does it properly, um, they can use it for remote code execution, right, to execute uh, arbitrary code. Um, but so uh, crashes in non-memory safe language, uh, in memory safe languages, excuse me, um, still cause like denial of service bugs. And some of these can be pretty important. Like uh, my favorite is uh, one uh, such bug that OSS Fuzz found in uh, Geth, which is like the Ethereum client written in Go, uh, which is a memory safe language. Um, this was just a simple uh, denial of service bug, but uh, it could have been used to uh, take down like every single um, geth node that was running at the time, and that would have been most of the Ethereum network. Um, so that's, uh, you know, denial of service is one reason to fuzz non-C++ code. Um, another thing you could do with non-C++ code is uh, testing for correctness. So there may be ways that you could sort of use like assertions uh, or other means to determine if your programs behave correctly. Um, that's one thing you could do. But uh, another technique that I really like is called differential fuzzing, where you'll use two different implementations of the same thing and compare the results. And if there are any differences, uh, that's a sign that one of them is incorrect. And so uh, there's one uh, fuzzer in OSS fuzz uh, that does this called crypto fuzz, which takes the um, math library, the math parts of different crypto cryptography libraries and uh, does the same operations uh, in each uh, library. So, you know, it could take like OpenSSL and do like an exponentiation there and compare the result to the same operation in, in embed TLS. And um, if you have uh, different results from, uh, from each of these library, from one of these libraries, then you know one of them is wrong. And so it's found tons of issues uh, using this technique. And finally, um, for like non-C++ code, uh, there's also the possibility of writing sanitizers that are, uh, you know, that could find this sort of generic classes of bugs um, that are not, uh, you know, generic classes of bugs um, and that are not application specific. So um, there's, you, typically it's harder to do these for uh, non-C++ or C languages because they're just better designed, I think. Like, you know, the language won't have as many sort of like warts like built into it. Um, but uh, like one such um, class of vulnerability would be something like command injection, right? Like this could, this is not app an application specific vulnerability. It's like, you know, it could be exhibited by any application and it's actually not even specific to any language. And so uh, we uh, actually wrote a sanitizer for command injection and uh, it managed to find, uh, we just wrote a blog post about this, but it managed to find um, a remote code execution that was like trivial 
uh, exploit in a um, image library, tiny gltf. Uh, all you needed to do is like backtick uh, a shell command and it would execute it. So there's also hope for um, you know writing basically sort of sanitizers to detect uh, non-C++ bugs that are also not application specific. So let's take a look at some of the fuzzing infrastructure that makes it possible to integrate fuzzing uh, into your software development process. Um, and the key like tool that we developed at Google um, that allows this is called uh, Cluster Fuzz. Um, Cluster Fuzz uh, basically aims to automate everything in fuzzing uh, except for like the parts that humans are absolutely necessary for. So. Uh, I, I'd say like those two parts are really just writing fuzzers, um, uh, fixing bugs, and also actually just like you know writing code uh, and introducing bugs, right? Um, and the way cluster fuzz works is uh, it just does continuous builds of your uh, fo uh, of your code and the fuzzers uh, testing that code, and um, it'll do continuous builds and then continuously fuzz them, and uh, it'll do things like corpus management, which is a bit. Uh, difficult if you are running fuzzers in parallel. Um, and uh, the most interesting thing, though, though it does is uh, what happens when it finds a crash. Um, when it finds a crash, it does a lot of things that you would have to uh, do on your own if you were running a fuzzer on your desktop, right? Like, if you've ever run a fuzzer on your desktop, you probably hit the same bug uh, like thousands of times. Um, you know, we can't report uh, thousands of issues for the same underlying bug, otherwise developers would kill us. So uh, Cluster fuzz uh, does, uh, uh, places a big emphasis on deduplicating bugs and making sure that they're actually unique so that we're not reporting the same crash over and over. Um, another thing it does is it minimizes the test case causing a crash uh, to basically um, you know, make it easier for the developer to debug and figure out what's going on. And after doing all this, uh, it'll, you know, it'll bisect to find out you know, when the bug was actually introduced and it'll file uh, an issue in our issue tracker and uh, assign it to uh, a developer uh, in some cases, uh, if it could figure out which commit introduced the bug uh, through bisection. Um, and then once uh, it's been assigned, it'll periodically test if the bug's been fixed in a new build, and it'll close the bug uh, if that's happened. So um, yeah, that, that's just, this basically is just summarizing some of the automation uh, cluster fuzz does like triaging crashes, um, deduplication, and reporting. Um, I think this quote is like feedback from uh, the curl developer, um, who you know mentions that just like false positives are like very low with um, with uh, with fuzzing. Uh, maybe he's not talking about de uh, duplicate issues, but um, in general, that's like another property of fuzzing that fall. You know, whenever you get a crash, it's typically because of a real issue. Um, Here's what it looks like when cluster fuzz files a bug. Uh, it provides a summary of what the issue is and uh, a few stack frames as well. And here you can see it actually assigned uh, an owner for the bug because based on the fact that they uh, authored a commit that introduced that bug. And uh, another nice feature I want to share that it does um, are coverage reports. So uh, cluster fuzz will actually show you um, which parts of your code are being fuzzed. And that will allow developers to maybe alter their fuzzer to, or write new fuzzers to cover uh, previous, uh, previously untested code. And so here's like, what it looks like on a file level. You can see you know, part of this function is called, but not all of it. So how can you get uh, this like, sort of workflow uh, at home? Um, the obvious solution would be to like, run ClusterFuzz yourself. Uh, ClusterFuzz is open source, and you know, anyone can run it in theory. Um, and they're actually like similar tools released by other companies. So uh, I mentioned Microsoft has their own infra called uh, OneFuzz. Um, and uh, I'd say like these things might take uh, you know a bit of maintenance to run. Um, and uh, like obviously we do it, so it's not like. But um, the, and, you know another thing that might um, you know be a problem is also that uh, they tend to be like tailored. I'd say towards the company that develops them, uh, their needs, right? So like. You know, ClusterFuzz uh, runs on hundreds of thousands of cores. Um, you may not need like a tool that uh, sort of is tailored for that use case. Um, you know, like OneFuzz like only runs in Azure, right? Um, you may not use Azure. You may not use Google Cloud. Uh, so the next uh, best solution, or really probably the best solution, if it's available to you, 
would be to use cluster fuzz uh, as a service. And the only uh, solution I know that allows for this is uh, OSS fuzz, which um, is basically you know, us providing cluster fuzz as a service to open source projects. Um, and it's a free service. We're not trying to you know, make money with this talk. Um, and uh, finally, um, a last solution I'll go over is cluster fuzz light, which is meant to be, uh, provide a lot of the same features as cluster fuzz, but is meant to be very easy to set up and maintain and runs in your CI, so you know, it can pretty much run anywhere you want it to. So um, you know, as I said, like running your own full-scale infra, there are like other companies that use cluster fuzz, um, but really like we're the main developer of it, and so I think it like probably is more tailored to our needs. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, like you know, it might be a bit more maintenance um, than you'd want to spend on fuzzing. Um, but maybe, you know, depending on how big you are, right? Like if you're a five person company, like probably not really worth it, um, unless it's like very security critical, maybe. Uh, so OSS fuzz uh, is basically this free version of cluster fuzz that we have as a service. And uh, pretty much, you know, we'll actually pay open source projects to use OSS fuzz. Uh, and that's because we want, you know, as part of my team's mission, the open source security team, um, we want open source to be as safe as possible. So like we even fuzz things like Firefox, which is not, you know, that's not like a product that Google really uses directly. You know, we have Chrome, um, but we'll fuzz Firefox because, you, you know, we care about like the ecosystem as a whole. Um, I think there are over 700 projects using OSS fuzz. Um, and it's found, I think, over 20,000 bugs. And I think about like 8,000 of them have been, you know, possibly security related, like, you know, use after free, uh, that sort of thing. You know, the others would be, Issues more like um, uh, issues more like null deref's or uh, maybe like you know integer overflows that don't lead to memory corruption. Um, we won't accept like toy projects, um, and also like you do need to be open source. But um, if you do qualify, like that's probably like the easiest way to get fuzzing into your uh, workflow. Um, and it's pretty easy to set up once you've like applied. Uh, you just have to write like a pretty. There's a pretty short like. YAML file that's just done for configuration that um, uh, can be generated by our tool. I, I didn't put that on the slide, but other than that, you'd have to write like a Docker file uh, to grab your program source code and uh, install any dependencies you need to build it. And then you just write a bash script uh, that uses our CXX flags and compiler uh, to build your project. Uh, and that's so that we could, um, the reason why we need uh, you to use our flags is so that we could, um, you know, pick whichever sanitizer we want. Um, I don't think I mentioned, but sanitizers uh, and the coverage feedback, that's all done through compile time instrumentation. So uh, if you're not open source though, um, and or for whatever reason uh, you can't use OSS fuzz uh, or cluster fuzz, we released another tool uh, that can help and that's called cluster fuzz light. Um, cluster fuzz light is a, uh, it's actually based on, it uses some of Cluster Fuzz's code, and uh, it's meant to run in CI. So it's actually, uh, in some ways, it has some advantages over Cluster Fuzz. Uh, beyond being easy to set up, uh, the feedback loop is much tighter. So like, rather than, um, you know, with Cluster Fuzz, you, uh, or OSS Fuzz, um, I didn't mention, but OSS Fuzz, yeah. Like, rather than just like committing your code, waiting for a build, and then waiting for a crash to be found, and then a bug filed, um, with cluster fuzz light, uh, you'll basically uh, get your, um, it'll test your like pull request while it's being reviewed and give you the crash right in CI. Um, it's much easier to set up than cluster fuzz uh, and it provides many of the same features like coverage reports uh, that you'd want. Um, and to get this working, we had to like adapt fuzzing a bit to CI. So um, we try to make it a bit more deterministic. Um, we try to make it uh, like, so we picked like 10 minutes as like sort of an arbitrary amount of time to fuzz for. Um, you know, we think this has a potential to find like 30 to like 50% maybe of uh, vulnerabilities that uh, fuzzing for like, you know, days would, um, which I think like if you're spending, you know, like 1% of the time to find like 50% of the bugs, that's like a pretty good trade off, I'd say, uh, if you can't afford to do the full, uh, full scale fuzzing. Uh, and uh, Cluster Fuzz Lite sort of was born from OSS Fuzz. Uh, and you know, a lot of OSS Fuzz users also use it because they like the sort of uh, tighter feedback loop where they get crashes in CI. Um, 
So it was born from OSS fuzz, and it has the integration is largely the same. So to, first, you would integrate your build with cluster fuzz light, and that just involves also a Docker file, um, like a one line config file, and uh, a bash script to build with our C flags. Um, and then to actually run cluster fuzz light, you'd have to configure your CI system uh, to use it. And so, like on GitHub, this is like, uh, like really, really trivial. Uh, you could literally just copy this file and that'll run cluster fuzz light for you in GitHub Actions. Um, and so, you know, if you were to do that, you'd get something like this, where on your pull requests, you would get um, cluster, uh, cluster fuzz light would run your fuzzers, um, turn red if it finds any crashes, and you could download the test cases that cause these crashes to debug it locally. And you know, you'll see like a stack trace also uh, where the crash occurred uh, as well. Um, this is a toy example, so the crash happens uh, in LVM fuzzer test one input. Uh, another feature of Cluster Fuzz Lite that I wanted to share, um, just to give you an idea for like uh, how much thought we put into um, you know trying to adapt it to fuzzing to CI, what is uh, fuzzer selection. So um, many uh, projects that use fuzzing uh, really go like all in and write tons and tons of fuzzers. So uh, System D um, is one user of OSS Fuzz and uh, I counted at least four uh, fuzzers that it has that begin with the letter B. Um, so, like, you know, extrapolating, I think there's probably around like 100 or, you know, high tens of fuzzers. And um, we can't run all of it. So if we're only fuzzing for 10 minutes, uh, if we were to run like 100 fuzzers, we probably wouldn't be spending enough time on each fuzzer to uh, really meaningfully find any bugs, you know, except super shallow ones. So what Cluster Fuzz Lite does instead is um, it'll look at the diff uh, of the pull request that it's uh, testing, and if the um, it'll look at that diff and it'll look at the coverage from the coverage reports of each fuzzer, and if uh, the fuzzer covers code that's being changed in the diff, then it knows that the fuzzer can test the code that's being changed and it runs that fuzzer uh, during you know while testing the pull request, and so this makes uh, you know um, cluster fuzz light like much more effective than a sort of more naive approach. Um, you know, like cluster fuzz actually uses the more naive approach, and that's because it can afford to, because you know it's basically running sort of like not interactively. So uh, to conclude my talk, uh, you should fuzz your code, or someone else will. Um, it's easy and effective to fuzz, and uh, we've got great tools to uh, help you fuzz. And um, you know, I'd be happy to help anyone do that uh, if they'd want to reach out afterwards. Uh, and I think we could take questions now. Let me get my headphones on. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, is it possible to run a cluster further? on some uh, kernel driver, and do you recommend that? Um, so uh, my talk was mostly about um, like user land fuzzing. Um, it is possible to use cluster fuzz with um, syscaller, which is uh, you know, like the Linux kernel fuzzer. Um, there's also some, uh, like syscaller has its own infra called sysbot. Um, and um, I, to be honest with you, I don't really know what uh, like the advantages of one, running one or the other would be uh, for running syscaller. I, 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 the one advantage I am familiar with, and like we, at Google we do run um, syscaller on both infras, um, is because uh, I think like um, certain projects within Google use uh, cluster fuzz for fuzzing user land code and kernel code, and so it's like a single sort of like you know process that's similar for developers no matter which uh, they're in. So um, yeah, good question, but you could use, like uh, you can use cluster fuzz for fuzzing um, kernel code, but you might want to just use sysbot. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, just a quick question. In terms of the chaos monkey and fuzzing, what, what is the kind of relationship there? Yeah, uh, I, I think I qualified like um, my, uh, um, I think I qualified like my history of fuzzing uh, part where I said, um, uh, you know, there might have been like forms of fuzzing uh, earlier that weren't called fuzzing. Um, and one of those uh, was a program called the monkey which I think is like the predecessor to, uh, I think Chaos Monkey is like for Android, right? Sorry, I can't. It's Netflix, I think. Netflix uh, uses it, but I don't know who originated it, really. Oh, well, I know there's a, well, so actually, I know Netflix does a lot of chaos engineering, which is maybe like a similar concept, but it's not really like something I know about. Um, so I guess I don't really know, um, I, I don't know maybe the specific tool, but there are tools called the monkey, um, which are meant for sort of sending like random clicks to uh, like GUI programs. Um, and so like one of these I, I think like existed in the 70s. Um, and there's one for uh, Android as well. I can't remember the exact name, but um, yeah, like uh, that's also like similar idea. But um, I guess like if you're simulating like user clicks, it's more of, um, maybe like a stability sort of uh, concern that you're looking at rather than like a security issue, right? Like um, if you're simulating what a user who's like clicking on your app can do, probably like they have the privileges to do whatever they want on the app anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, sorry if I don't know uh, enough to answer that question. Uh, is there any way to keep state while fuzzing? Say, for example, uh, the, all the fuzzers that I've seen, uh, AFL, if we are uh, writing a harness, we can only provide one input to it, right? So what if the application that I'm using uh, is a, uh, the server side of a protocol, and I'm trying to find a, a thread race condition related issue where I need two different input yeah. to trigger it. And how can I uh, handle those kind of cases? Yeah, I, I think the solution to that is snapshot fuzzing. Although, to be honest with you, I'm not super familiar with it as we don't really do it yet. Um, but uh, like they're pretty like well developed, or decently user-friendly tools um, for that that have been developed that I think uh, can handle um, you know, sort of more like you, you know, racy conditions or like sort of like full like system fuzzing rather than like, uh, like, you know, at least with libfuzzer, like it wouldn't handle that well at all. Like it's, you know, if it's state, if your code is stateful at all, um, like it's gonna really mess things up. Like it should be ideally like set back to the same state every time that LVM fuzzer test one input uh, function gets executed. Okay, so that means we are not yet matured enough to do stateful fuzzing. So well, is... like I think snapshot fuzzing probably is, but I, like I guess I'm not sure because I don't really do it. Um, but I, I would like if you're trying to do that, I would say like look at that. My recommendation would be to like look into that. I, I don't know for sure that it does what you're trying to do, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks for coming, everyone.